Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Well, hi everyone, my name is Ryan, Ryan Robinson, and I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, thank you guys so much. I'm setting up my, my whiteboard because uh, I'm really excited to present to you guys today about, first of all, what is quantum computing? What does that have to do with anything uh, related to our real world and where did it come from? Um, so quick background for me, I know the, the team at Blockchain Center uh, introducing, but quick background for me, I'm an MIT alum. And so I've said a lot of people have actually created these algorithms that you, you're going to see here. Um, so again, Blockchain Center, thank you so much for having me as your keynote speaker. I really appreciate it. So one, we're going to break down this presentation into three parts, three parts. Okay. So first, we're going to explain what the heck is quantum physics? Where did it come from? What's the history? Right. That's number one. Number two, we're going to explain quantum computing, quantum computing, so an application of quantum physics. Then three, we're going to explain what the application of quantum computing is. In other words, with finance, with blockchain, stuff like that. So we're going to start from the beginning and work through the history all the way up. So again, three sections. So after each section, I'm going to pause for a second. It was about five minutes, 10 minutes, just to answer questions you guys may have, because I know it's a lot of content. It's a lot of content. So first, let me explain what quantum is. So quantum, and let me know if you guys can see that. Can you guys see that? Is that clear? I would say that is yes. So quantum has three major components, okay? So first is it has what's called a probabilistic nature. So it's probability. And I'll talk about what all these things mean in a second. So we have probability, then you have discreteness, so I'll just say discrete, and then you have something that's really interesting called superposition. So if you forget everything from this talk, these are the three points that you want to remember, is that quantum physics is one, is probabilistic, two, that it's discrete, and three, it has something called superpositions superpositions. Okay, so I'm going to break down this very briefly to you guys, and we're going to start hitting, going to the history of it. So probability. So the first things first is that quantum basically turned everything that scientists and physicists knew about the universe on its head. So for instance, we drop an apple, right? You say, okay, apple's going to fall to the ground 100% of the time. It turns out that as you go smaller and smaller and smaller, I mean, like really, really small, is that it actually doesn't work that way. It doesn't work where the apple will definitely fall to the ground. In fact, in a quantum world, the apple actually has a possibility of phasing through the floor, phasing through the floor. So in other words, all the outcomes of our actions aren't definitive, they aren't certain, they're probabilistic. It means that it's likely to happen, it may happen, but nothing's for certain. That's number one. Number two, discrete. So discrete here, what that means is that the universe operates in just discrete mass. Let me explain what discrete means. So discrete means it operates in stuff like integers. So one, two, three, four, discrete, discrete units. Before this, before quantum physics, before the 1900s, people thought that the world was continuous, continuous. So the way I would explain this to you guys, discrete nature, what it means is think about a water fountain. So if you have a water fountain, right, and you have the, the faucet on, it's a continuous stream. It's a stream of water. What quantum discovers is that zoom in very carefully, you'll see that the world is actually discrete, meaning that it works more like imagine you have that faucet and you turn down the water pressure a little bit. You get those droplets. So drop, 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 drop. So that continuous stream you saw of water is really just a bunch of droplets all together. So again, quantum says, okay, the universe actually operates in these discrete units. And that can be with everything. So in other words, with time. So in other words, there's a certain time that the universe operates in. You sort of think of it like a movie. So a movie, we're watching one continuous stream of action, of motion. But the universe is actually just showing you. That's the animation. That's the special effects. What's really going on is the same thing if you look at a movie frames per second. So in other words, what I'm saying to is the universe has a frames per second. And so all those things apply to space, to time, everything, even to our own matter. Everything is a discrete. 
And finally, superposition. So superposition, what that means is, is that basically superposition is where one thing holds two states at the same time, has two feelings at the same time. So in other words, I'll talk about computers. So computers either have zeros or ones, zeros or ones. And so in other words, think about like a path, right? Left or right, left or right. Binary is what it's called. With quantum, it has this, this property called superposition. What superposition means is that it can basically explore both paths at the same time. It could be zero and one at the same time. It could be left and right at the same time. It could be whatever those two binary options are. Binary just means two. So hopefully that doesn't confuse anybody. And so again, quantum just threw everything on its head. Because one, you're saying, okay, if I have this apple, I drop it a billion times. One of those times, it's going to actually phase through the floor. So crazy. The screen. The universe is just basically showing us some special effects. The universe that we see is a, is a movie. Behind the scenes, it's really just a bunch of pictures being streamed together. Then three, superposition. So what that means is, is that the universe can actually have two different values at the same time. It can have two different feelings. And so this one's probably, to me, one of the most, I think, confusing ones, right? It's like, how, do you, how are you two things? How are you going left and right at the same time? And so the way I explain this in an intuitive sense, I mean, we all actually have this, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, we feel a sense kind of like superposition, kind of like superposition, in the sense that, you know, we all have family members, you know, friends that we have that we love, and they just do something that's so irky, right? It's so annoying, and you, you like, why are you doing this? You're so, then you find that person to be super frustrating, right? But you still love them, though. You still care about them. So superposition is that same notion of these conflicting ideas held together at the same time. For In psychology, they might call this dissonance dissonance so it's holding two conflicting ideas at the same time so in other words even though this may seem far out there actually if you think about it in terms of everyday metaphors it makes a lot of sense so now i'm going to go down the history of quantum the history of quantum computing so first when we got when we talk about quantum physics, right? We have to talk about philosophy. We have to talk about the leaders, intellectual leaders of Western civilization. So if you go back to about 300, 300 BC, right here, you have some famous thinkers. I don't know if you guys can see that. We got some famous thinkers here. You've got Plato. You've got Aristotle. And you've got Socrates. And this is not in the correct order, by the way. And Socrates. So these three major thinkers that are the foundations for a lot of our science today and our philosophies. And so, and this is in ancient Greece. So these thinkers are some of the first uh, people that really illuminate how the world works. So for instance, Aristotle wrote about metaphysics. He wrote about biology. He wrote about medicine. He wrote about animals. Remember, I mean, back in these days, but now we take everything for granted. You know, we go to a zoo and we see a million different animals. Back then, you know, when you saw people, when they first saw monkeys, they thought monkeys were actually people. They thought they were hairy people, a species of man. And so these people are discovering and understanding and inventing the nomenclature that we use today to understand the universe. So you have Aristotle and you have Socrates, who starts off the whole thing saying, listen, I don't know anything. I know, he says, I'm the wisest, but I know that I know nothing, that I know that I know nothing. Then you have Plato, who's more so in the humanities aspect. He says, listen, this is how society should operate. We've got to have these, these kings, and we've got to work like this, the society's going to work like that. So for those of you who are familiar with Plato, he wrote a book called The Republic. The Republic debates, he outlines what democracy and, and republicanism should look like. So it's had a huge influence on our government today, thousands of years later. So the reason that I bring these guys up is because these guys, at this point in time, there was no such thing as a scientist. Okay, so what you recall was just a philosopher. You were a thinker. You were someone that walked around and said, I wonder how the universe works. And so these were some of the first philosophers. And then later, philosophers then begin to specialize. You're going to have political philosophers, so like Locke, mm -hmm. Voltaire, all these people who make, uh, who help influence our founding fathers. And then you have natural philosophers, which are basically the scientists before scientists was a thing. Scientists before science was a thing. And so these guys are the progenitors of all that. The reason I bring them up is because you've got to remember that quantum is all about uncertainty. And so the weird thing about human evolution in terms of our knowledge 
is that we start out here, 300 BC, uncertain, right? So we have no idea what's going on. We have no idea what's going on. And then fast forward, fast forward to 1905. Eight, this is easy, 80. And so in this time period, we have what's called a crescendo, a crescendo of certainty, crescendo of certainty. What that means is we just we learn more things, right? We learn about biology, about medicine, about herbs, about exploration. I mean, go back to these guys. They had no idea that America existed, Latin America existed, Canada existed. They had no idea. You know, go back, it wasn't until 1492, or really before that with the Vikings, but the most commonly cited one, of course, is 1492 with Columbus. And so between this time period and that time period, we're learning more about ourselves, the world, and particularly how the world works, what we would now call physics, physics. So with this, we now get people in between. So this is 1905. This is 300 BC. You've got somebody here in about 1660 named Newton. Now, Newton is actually living a similar time period to us in many ways because in his time period, he actually was at school when there was a plague breakout. There was this whole pandemic going on. And so he sent back home. He sent back home. And what is he doing in his free time? He basically just kind of sits and thinks about all these problems. He thinks about, you know, why do the planets orbit the way they do? You know, why, why are the shapes of the stars that way? How, what is light made of? He asks, he asks all these variable questions. And he, keep in mind, he's only at this point in his early 20s. And he spends all his time thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And he comes down to Newton's laws of motion. Newton's laws of motion. And this changes the whole world. This is the point where we're talking about question mark, right? At this point, everyone knew everything. So I'll put a book here. Right? So at this point, Newton's laws changed how we saw the world. Because at that point, we saw the world as something that was deterministic. So that notion, right, of, hey, if I drop this apple, it's going to fall to the ground, that was made fact by Newton. Before that, people knew that intuitively, right, but they didn't know that for a physical fact. They didn't know that for a physical fact. So Newton comes in and says, here, listen, here's the math and the theory behind all of this, behind all of this. So from 300 B.C., we now go to 1660 A.D., where it feels like we can explain practically everything because Newton's laws can explain things in biology, with the brain, with the universe and the stars. It was amazing. In fact, he actually transforms our notion of the universe itself into this, a, looking at it as a machine. It's called the Newtonian universe, the Newtonian universe. To Newton, his universe was one where God basically just wound up a little clock. Imagine a pocket watch. He wound it up and then he just put it there and let it, that's it, and let it rotate, move through time. In other words, his notion of the universe was basically created by created by a creator, a natural creator, but something that where the creator did not intervene. Everything was already predetermined. So what you did today was based on variables that happened yesterday, based on things in your biology. In other words, in Newton's world, if I give you all the information about everything, so I'll give you some example, coin toss, right? If you flip a coin, we say, what are the odds of it being 50-50? Or we use our heads or tails, you said it'd be 50-50. And, but that's based on not knowing all the information. If I said to you, okay, well, if I flip this coin, right, with this much momentum and this direction, and there's got the air resistance, and you've got all these different variables, I give you all the information, right? You can tell me, okay, it's probably, it's gonna be heads because of all these variables. It's gonna rotate 10 times, and it's gonna land, boom, it's gonna be heads. That's what Newton says. And for the most part, that was pretty much true. It was pretty much true. At this point, after Newton, they're saying, okay, well, universe is pretty much figured out. We've got a few loose ends. We're pretty much done. So fast forward. This is 1905. Fast forward, you get to Einstein, right? So Einstein was basically the most, one of the most blasphemous people ever because it says, actually, that's not exactly how things work. So he blows Newton's work out of the water. He says, okay, Newton, a lot of things you said make sense, but only in certain contexts. Specifically, what we're talking about, quantum physics, is he shows, first things first, the invention, the proof of atoms. Atoms. So right now, atoms is something we take for granted. It's something we take for granted. So of course there's atoms, of course there's atoms. But in Einstein's time, 100 years ago, 
that wasn't certain. People used it as like a metaphor to explain how the universe works. So in other words, if I were a scientist about 1902, 1903, I'd say, well, and I'm talking to another physicist, I'd say, well, just imagine there is this thing like an atom. And so let me explain what an atom is, first of all. So an atom actually goes back to 300 BC. Atom is a Greek word. And so around this guy's time, Aristotle, Aristotle says, listen, I basically got everything figured out. And a philosopher at that same time, one of his contemporaries, his name was Democritus. Democritus says, well, I have this idea. Right? Well, yeah, I believe that if I have this, whatever it is, uh, let's see, if I have this marker and I cut it in half, I cut it in half again, I cut it in half again, right? So if I say I have this, whatever, say a piece of wood, and I cut it in half, I cut it in half again. And again, at a certain point, there's going to get to a, a small enough size where I cannot divide that thing anymore and it still be that thing. And so in other words, if I have this wood, I cut it in half, I cut it half again, and I cut it half again. So eventually it's so, so, so small, eventually gets to a point where if I cut it one more time, it's no longer wood. It's no longer wood. So the word Adam, Adam, let's see, I got to read somebody. All right, sorry, guys. So the word Adam, again, is Greek, and it actually has two words in it. People don't realize. And so a lot of these words that we're talking about, quantum, atom, the etymology of the word will tell you what it means. So atom, right? And so we think of atom usually like this, like a big, just a ball of something. A tum, atum. So a is Greek for non, for non, right? And you look at any word, you know, usually in English, and it has that, that prefix to it, the a. Right, so a good word would be anachronistic. Um, sorry, I know it's my SAT side coming out. Anachronistic, I know it's like a, a random word. But anachronistic, right, means out of time. A, Anna, there's similar prefixes. They mean out of time. They mean displaced from time. A means to negate. So when you see atom, it's not something. Not something means tum is a thing. It's a thing. So when atom, the Magritte use it to mean indivisible indivisible. So when Einstein comes in 1905, and he's just a patent clerk, right? He has no idea that is how, what his work is going to do. And no one really respected him at the time because he basically just made it through college. I mean, he wasn't like a super PhD accomplished person. He was just a guy basically just made it through college, found a job that was outside of his career. It would just kind of sit there and daydream for most of his day. And it ends up revolutionizing science. And so he then discovered atoms. Atoms. He finds that, again, the universe operates in these discrete units. These discrete units. So in other words, the universe is not this continuous flow of water. It's droplets. It's droplets. And in fact, that brings me to the etymology of the word quantum. So quantum should sound similar to you guys for another word, right? Quanta, quantitative, quantitative finance. And so there's a common core there, even though it seems like it's very it's esoteric. So quantum broken down has a root word. And this is where my literature background is coming in handy. So quantum comes from the word quanta. Now this word is Latin. The other words we looked at were Greek. But this word, it just means count. That's all it means. It just means count. And so fast forward, 1905, you've got Einstein says, listen, there's this thing called quantum physics. I don't believe in it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And so at that time, you have all these physicists coming in saying, what's going on? Because the physics that they discovered shows a world, again, that is not deterministic. You drop the apple, it doesn't fall. It phases through the ground. It phases through the ground. And so really quick, you're conflicted. I'll show you how conflicted they are. Use an example a lot of you may be familiar with called Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat. So with that, there's a box. And inside it is a cat. Don't judge my cat too much. And so inside it is a cat. Now there's a vial of poison, but pee for poison. And basically, they have it where they put in a situation where they say, okay, here's this quantum physics effect. Again, probabilistic, 50-50, heads or tails, we don't know. 
And they say, okay, well, 50-50, this thing, this quantum, it's called a, a radiation. They use a radiation to say, if this, if this radiates, if it splits out an atom, splits out these atoms, and it basically has a poison unlock itself, right? It spills out, then the cat will die based on these quantum principles. But now, remember what I said in the beginning. So there's three properties to quantum. There's probabilistic, there's discrete, and what was the last one? Superposition, superposition. So before you look into the box, right? Before you look into the box, is that this radiation here has both radiated an atom and not radiated an atom. It's radiating atom and both not radiated atom. So how does that make sense? No clue. That's why Schrodinger made up the example. In fact, he was trying to prove with the Schrodinger's cat example how little sense quantum actually made. He says, guys, okay, so you're telling me if I put a cat in the box and I link it to some poison that's based on radiation, so something that's, again, discrete 50-50 superposition, then this cat is both alive and dead at the same time because this right here, the radiation, is both radiated and not radiated at the same time. And they said, well, Schrodinger, we don't really have a good answer for you. In other words, what I'm saying to you is there's a reason that you haven't seen these quantum effects on a macroscopic level. In other words, on your day-to-day -day life. The quantum rules I'm telling you about, discrete, probabilistic, and superposition, are on the small, small microscopic level. I'm talking about even smaller than cells. It's dramatic. It's really, really dramatic. And so fast forward, you get to the now. the 1980s, right? This thing that made no sense. We're just going to roll with it. But then you get to 1980s at MIT. So we go to now 1980. And they're talking about the first annual conference of the computation of physics. The computation of physics. So anyone who remembers the 1980s or knows about the 1980s or second 1980s knows that was a huge, huge, huge era for computers for computers. I mean, this is the advent, this is the coming of age of Apple and other companies, Microsoft, that were creating the personal computing industry. It was Apple, Microsoft, IBM, all contributing to this new wave, this new culture, this new technology that the world was beginning to adapt in the nice days. The physicists were also a part of that wave, just not talked about it much. So in 1980 at MIT, they had a conference saying, okay, well, how do we use these computers? What, how do computers and physics, how do they come together? And so, Richard Feynman at this point, who was an MIT alum, an MIT alum, some of you may have heard his name before, basically in a Q&A session, actually in a keynote speech just like this actually, outlines the development of a computer that the world had never seen before, called a universal simulator, a universal simulator. And this simulator uses these properties of superposition, of uh, prob probability, of discreteness to predict nature better than any computer ever has to date, 40 years later. And that is what we call a quantum computer. So I'm gonna pause there for a second, open up for a few questions um, for the next, what is that, four or five minutes, and then we'll move on to quantum computers. So guys, go ahead, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I'll erase this in the meantime. <laughs> I don't see any questions, so I think we might be good. And if you see any questions, you can type them for me here. I don't think I can see the, okay, awesome.
Will quantum computers be able to find the lost BTC over the years? That's a good question. Um, in reality, no, not really. And because of the time scale. So in the short term, a Ryan, a Ryan Cooper. Oh, great question, man. A great question. So um, not really. And the reason why is because basically the quantum computer is, so theoretically, yes. So if I give you the most like accurate answer, yes. The reason I say not really is because the quantum computers are just not there yet. So when a lot of times it's actually going to the second part here, but quantum computers are very, can be very powerful theoretically, but they're just not there yet. So in other words, our science is up here, but our engineering is still trying to catch up. So as a, as a theoretical person, I could say, <clears throat> listen, Ryan, here's a quantum computer you need to find those lost Bitcoin. But as an engineer, I'd say, well, to make that computer to do that is going to take a lot, a lot of research, a lot, a lot of time, a lot, a lot of experimentation. Um, to give you guys an idea, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in the next section. Is one of the, I mean, quantum computers haven't really done a lot of profound novel computations, um, let alone find lost Bitcoin. I mean, the, one of the biggest uh, applications we've seen so far is, is factoring 15. You know, so it, it's, it's not, it's, this is all very nascent. It's all very new stuff. Um, so, but if they did find it, if someone did make a quantum computer to find it, it would take about approximately, I'd say, 10 years based on what people in the industry expect will, how the, the, the field will evolve over this next decade. So yeah, that's how I would answer that question. Oh, great question, Bradley. That's a great question. Um, and so that just basically just goes right into actually the next section. Um, so right on time. Uh, um, and feel free to keep feeding me questions and I'll segue into here. But the big challenges for developing a quantum computer go into what's called decoherence. Decoherence. So decoherence means that basically quantum computers are really buggy. They're really, really buggy. So a cloud computer, you know, think about bugs like viruses and stuff like that. A quantum computer is naturally buggy. And I'll explain why in a second. So they're buggy because they use these things called qubits. Qubits. So qubits are different from a normal bit. So we think of a computer, computer you're on right now, it uses bits. So it stores zeros or it stores a one. So every bit can either store a zero or the word here, or a one. It stores one possibility. It stores one possibility. But however, for quantum computers, they can store zero and one. So that's like their whole thing. That's like their their superpower. So you're so normal computer, oh, I can only hold one thing at a time while as quantum computers can hold both. So it's really powerful. But the challenge is these qubits are very, very sensitive. They're very moody. And the reason is because they're so small and they have to be um, controlled. That's in such a controlled environment that they're very sensitive to any outside interference, any outside interference. These qubits can be de detected or disturbed rather by anything, anything. When I say anything, I mean literally anything. So. In other words, if you have something that is even, say, one degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature from that thing, so say it's like a piece of bread, just keep it simple, piece of bread, right? So it's basically super cold, but it's near a qubit, that piece of bread is going to disturb your qubit and mess up all your results, and mess up all your results. And that's part of the reason, for anyone who's interested in modern physics and stuff like that, particle accelerators, that's why they have them usually underground, because it's try they're trying to prevent a lot of... Uh, influence or interference from different waves. Um, some of you who are familiar with older TVs, you might hear that static. -y that was actually space waves coming in. You're actually, your, your TV was detecting uh, radioactive waves from space. And so that's how sensitive these things can be, um, let alone on a microscopic atomic level, less than atomic level, actually. See, so that was one question. I said, now we've got a few of them. Um, how will quantum computers? And I know there's a few of them, so you can feel free to type them, and I'll answer Ryan's question right now. Um, how will quantum be improved moving forward? I know they're very sensitive. What are you thinking? We work on to improve the sensitivity. So, first of all, just like you're saying, is they're going to be improved by making them less sensitive. That's the hope. Um, number one. Number two is this. Honestly, you know, I think people in the crypto space can definitely relate to this. Is we're really trying to find a lot of use cases for them. 
Um, crypto, you know, there's so many, it's awesome. There's so many altcoins, everyone's trying new things. With quantum, it's a little bit, it's, it's definitely less just because there's so much, um, there's just so much, there's a barrier to entry, right? I mean, you gotta know the quantum physics, you gotta know the engineering, you gotta know the math. I mean, you gotta, and then the business person has to be able to explain all these things to you, right? So say you're, you're a quantum computing specialist and trying to get a team, right? You have your, your salesman, you know, like how do you explain, hey, I made this quantum computing, you know, product. So that's one of the challenges, it's actually something that my company, we see every day because we're using uh, quantum computing principles to develop new products. We're actually developing a COVID-19 diagnostic test that I'll talk about um, here, just in terms of application, general application, not just my test. But um, again, so the, uh, making it uh, less sensitive, which is a challenge, and I'll talk about the philosophy of that in a second, but you're making it less sensitive, you're finding more use cases for it. Um, and then three is it really is trying different architectures. So there's different types of ways to build a computer. You know, we know a computer as, you know, a keyboard, a mouse, a screen. It's not the same thing for quantum computers. Quantum computers, the physics of it, you know, there's a lot more ways to go about doing it. So for instance, some computers actually, quantum computers use MRI. So the same thing you see in a hospital, that same principle, they use that for quantum computers. Some people use topological uh, computers. Some people use, um, it's called uh, superfluids, which are these basically these fluids that act like, like quantum. They have these quantum principles, but on a macroscopic level, on a macroscopic level. Uh, how I intend on and improving it is basically uh, my company, Conduit, is we're actually designing a long-term vision, long-term vision, is actually designing the world's first personal quantum computer. So same thing you're saying now, again, with your, you're on your computer now, you're on your phones, what would that look like for a, using a quantum computer? Um, so we're really excited for the next few years. We're designing out these, these use cases, fleshing out these applications that you'll eventually be on one platform um, that will be the world's first personal quantum computer. So I'm really excited. Um, and that answers that question. And then to um, how will it affect blockchain? And actually, you guys asked great questions. I was like putting these later on in the presentation, but I'll just go straight into it. So it will affect blockchain. The biggest thing is something called elliptic curve cryptography. Elliptic curve cryptography, and let me start to raise this board so I can use the board again. So elliptic curve cryptography, just like it sounds, it's, it's helped to secure a lot of your secrets. And of course, as you guys may know, that's the basis for blockchain. Um, so the way that quantum will affect that is that basically, it's, it's, to, to answer that in detail, it uses an algorithm called Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm. And what it does, so Shor's algorithm is really good at factoring numbers. So I'll give you guys a number. Hopefully you guys can see this. I know it might be reverse. I might be saying one thing, you might see the reverse image. So let me know. But so the way a lot of um, security works, cryptography works, is through factorization. So you have this really big number. I'm just going to make up a number. So three, I'll say three, two, nine, seven, five, three. And say that's that's two numbers, right? So I'll say N times M. So the way your your all your data is secure on the internet is by basically associating your information, your password, with these really big prime numbers. Do you mind notes my photography is out there? I don't know if this is a prime number. I just made somewhere up, so I don't know you. It's okay. And once I've factored this, long story short, I can figure out your data. Now, the the way it works. That's why if you talk to anyone who's a security specialist, they say, well, really, nothing's really unhackable if it's connected to the internet, if it's communicating with other machines. Um, the way you make it practically unha un unhackable is you make it where to solve this problem, right? To figure out what the variables are, you have to basically have one, a crazy big computer, one, a powerful computer, and two, it's got to factor this guy in time, right? So when someone says, oh, well, technically everything's hackable, what they mean is that this number is factorable. It's just, it's going to take a long time, a long, long time. In fact, to give you guys an idea of a time scale, you're talking about four to the 10 times three, or something depending on the problem, depending on the number. So you might try and say hack somebody. If you don't know their information or whatever, it might take you the age of the universe, so billions of years, you know, to crack that 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 code. So anyone who's done trying to do crypto mining with just their laptop has a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, so it takes it's a, it's a lot. And so quantum computers can do something called Shor's algorithm. Let me make that bigger. Shor's algorithm, and he's again he's another person that actually taught at MIT. And what this does is it factors this dramatically a lot faster than normal computers. So normal computers, again, they basically, if you think about like they're running, right? So think about if I'm running, hold on a second, let me erase this. 
So the way to explain it and so to get the picture across is when someone's normally running, right? You're running linearly. You're running linearly, meaning that your speed doesn't change. Your speed doesn't change, right? So if you're going five miles per hour, you just, you just keep going five miles per hour. But the way quantum computers work, the reason they're so powerful is that they use something called quantum parallelism. Quantum parallelism. They, they get faster. They get faster, faster. So you're running, so imagine you're running a marathon, right? And you're, you're going your five miles per hour. And the guy next to you starts off super slow. And you're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm fine. He's not going to win. But he gets a little bit faster every second. A little bit faster. A little bit faster. A little bit faster. But not just, again, one mile, two miles, three miles, four miles. I'm talking about one mile, two miles, four miles, 16 miles, 64 miles, 100, you know, that type of thing. Where this guy, to say run across, you know, the earth is like that because he's getting faster every second exponentially. So while computers solve things linearly, meaning that their ability to compute is basically the same, like you add another bit to your computer system, you now you have two bits. But because quantum computers, remember, superposition, so they now have, so if I have a, say I have a link, so I have a classical machine here, so these are all gonna represent bits, right? So I've got a classical machine here. So we'll put classical, I don't know if you guys can see that, I'll just put Q, or C. Right, so this guy can store zero or one, and a one. So say he has two bits, he's got a zero and a one. He's got two possibilities. If I have a quantum computer, I can store zero and one, zero and one. So I've now stored, he stored two possibilities, right? And now I've stored four possibilities, but the same amount of space, same number of bits that the classical machine had. So that's what you're seeing here, right? So number of bits, right, is linear for a classical machine. For a quantum computer, it goes exponential. So that's why you always lose out to a classical, uh, a quantum machine. But again, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, so now I see another question. Do you think we'll see quantum cell phones? Oh, my first question was, what are quantum computers bad at? Um, oh, that's a good question. So what are quantum computers bad at? They are bad, honestly, they're really bad at almost everything. Um, and so when you see like a lot of the hype, the articles, just take it all the grain of salt. I'll give you a, a specific example. I believe this is the end of 2019. It was called the recommendation problem. So yeah, every time you know, you're on Netflix, you're on Amazon, they're trying to recommend you certain products, certain shows. Here, yeah, you bought this, so you might want to buy that. You saw this, you might want to see that. That's called the recommendation problem. And so they thought that quantum computers could solve that, again, using this quantum parallelism, right? Okay. We can solve this. This is our thing. We've got this. Turns out, no, actually, classical computers can still do it better. Um, and in fact, just to add to this, you know, my background, is, hopefully, I think Anna mentioned it, is we're working, my company, Condo, is actually working with the White House right now it's called the HPC Consortium, High Performance Computing Consortium. So we're working with supercomputers to actually find a cure for COVID, COVID-19. And the big thing is, is that quantum computers, even though they're very powerful, it will be very powerful, they're just not there yet, one. And two, supercomputers are still getting better. That's the thing. It's kind of like we're trying to kind of count class computers out of the conversation. Like, oh, you're done. Your time's over. But it's really not because class computers are now expanding to um, what's called exoflop computing. Exoflop computing, which means that right now, if you get a typical supercomputer, it's going to be around, I'll say about a million, worth a million smartphones of computing power. So on average, one supercomputer would be about worth a million smartphones. Exoflop means that one supercomputer will then be worth 1 billion smartphones. 1 billion smartphones. So again, cloud computing, they've been trying to count it out, but it's just really quantum computing, guys, is going to more so looks like it's going to be applied to specific problems, specific problems. Um, some of those problems, as we're going to be highlighting in this conference, are portfolio optimization, um, as well as just general optimization problems. Now, honestly, they're best at, let's go back to what I was saying before, Richard Feynman. Go back to 1981, he's doing his keynote at MIT, right? It's only like 20 people, because like who's studying quantum physics computing in 1980? You know, this is before computers were even a thing. So it's like 20 people at this conference, um, where ironically they made history. But the point being is they, they brought it up, right? They brought it up to simulate physics experiments. Because what happened is that they had these physicists saying, listen, we're using computers, this is a great invention. You know, we kind of reached a limit here for them. How do we simulate these quantum physics principles? How do we simulate these quantum principles? And that's what Richard Feynman then says, you gotta make a quantum computer. You gotta make what he called a universal simulator. 
In other words, something that can simulate the classical part of nature, so leaves and snow falling to the ground, as well as quantum parts of nature, which may seem esoteric, like, okay, where's quantum in nature? The, actually, it's relevant to everything we do every day. If, you're, if you have ever eaten food, whether vegetarian or carn carnivorous, quantum has helped your life because quantum is the basis for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Plants use quantum physics to make the food we're saying either we eat that plant, right, or we eat the thing that eats that plant. So quantum has a, is a fundamental part of our daily lives. It also has huge in, uh, ramifications in biology as well in terms of DNA, but that's one other, one other topic. Um, do you think we will see quantum cell phones? So a great question. That actually goes, I erased it, but to quantum, that actually talks about what, what my specialty is called quantum engineering. And so really quick, really quick, is quantum engineering, right? People always ask, what the heck is quantum engineering? So again, those, um, maybe joining a little late, is that my background is I studied under Seth Lloyd, who created their first paper, how to physically implement the universal simulator that Feynman outlined in 1980. So then he called, he was the first quantum mechanic. Studying under him, I became the world's first quantum engineer. So people again say, what the heck is quantum engineering? So to that question, do you think we will see quantum cell phones? That's basically what quantum engineering is. So when you think about right now, right, we said, okay, well, it's going quantum physics, right? Quantum physics, I'll put Q physics. And then we're going to quantum computing, right? The way that quantum engineering comes into play here is that quantum engineering is really the it's it's really the root, it's the branch. So in other words, quantum engineering. So I'll put that here, quantum engineering. Quantum computing is just one application. It's just one application. There are plenty of other applications. And so specifically to your question, do you think we will see quantum cell phones? That would be another application of quantum engineering. But now what's interesting to his point about, do you think we would see quantum cell phones? Here are some of the challenges, again, that you would have to um, confront, right? Figure out an answer to, to get those quantum cell phones. So one is temperature control, temperature control. So I actually want to link it back with another question someone asked about quantum computers and improving their sensitivity. So the reason that this stuff is challenging, the reason that, um, that to your question, answer your question, is that you got to remember that the universe is interconnected. The universe is interconnected. So what that means is, is that anytime you try and just, I mean, just think about it, right? So we saw that with, just as a, as a, as a species, this last year with 2020, right? When someone gets sick over here, it affects somebody over there. We're interconnected. The universe is the same thing. So for instance, uh, when you look up at the night sky, right? You're seeing light from stars that may have died millions of years ago, just now reaching you. So the effect of something millions of years away or in time, but also in space, millions of light years away, can still affect you all the, all the way here on Earth in your personal life. So the universe is interconnected. It's, it's a web. So anytime you move here, you've now affected all the other webs attached to say that. So if I was like a like Spider-Man or something like that, right? I'm, I'm using my spider webs. If I move my arm, right, then all the, the webs attached to this arm then move with it. Then move with it. Right, and so in other words, the challenge for quantum computing on a deep level, um, and this is one of those things, again, if you forget everything else in this presentation, one of the things you want to remember, the challenge is that the universe is interconnected. But the smaller you go, right, the more interconnected it actually becomes. So the challenge is how do you basically control these quantum, these qubits, when they're so interconnected with everything else around it? Everything else around it. Remember, we're talking about something that's smaller than an atom here. You're talking about electrons and photons, and these things are very, very small. Keep in mind, an electron is, is a lot smaller than a photon for all my physics people out there. Um, and so you say, how do I control this environment that is so, so, so sensitive to everything else around it? And again, that brings me back to what decoherence is. So decoherence is basically trying to have this controlled environment, but something affects that, it causes it to go out of whack in a way that you did not intend, in a way you did not intend. So that's an important thing there. So specifically, do you think we will see quantum cell phones? The big challenge you have to answer is decoherence. And now let me explain what decoherence is in a day-to-day -day sense. So decoherence is temperature. So when you 
So you touch like a, I don't know if anyone has ever touched like a hot pan or anything that's like you're like, oh, that's that's really hot. What's going on, right? Is that your fingers, your nerves are detecting motion, detecting motion, and it's, it's said your brain says, well, that's that's bad for us. Let's move away. So temperature is motion. So when you feel something that's really hot, it's really cold, you're really detecting the motion of that thing, the motion of that thing. And so in our daily lives, right, obviously the weather, you know, there's a range depending on where you are, but it's not the range compared to like empty space, right? So our temperatures may say go from, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use a Fahrenheit uh, for my Celsius people, sorry for a second, but for Fahrenheit, right, you might have, I'm in Boston. So in Boston, you might see anywhere from say 10 degrees Fahrenheit, to even actually 100 degrees, actually during the summer, you get pretty crazy. But with that, even at 10 degrees Fahrenheit, that's still a lot of motion. That's still a lot of movement. It's a lot, a lot of movement. And so the problem with that quantum cell phone would be basically it would be bugging out. You have a hard time getting signal because the temperature, even if you're in cold, cold areas, will make it bug out. You'll call people by accident. You know, it'll text people by random, stuff like that. Um, and so you've got to have a temperature control. We gotta have temperature control. And I wanna bring this back to one more element of this conversation that's really important to note. So I'm saying, guys, okay, quantum, it's interconnected. So let's, let's, let's kind of quantify that for a second. So one of the properties, I'm gonna erase this, one of the properties of quantum that blew people away, I didn't highlight at the beginning, because it was already a lot, but is what's called wave particle duality. Wave particle duality. So when we talk about quantum, uh, but in the beginning, right, we said it basically like this little ball, this little ball. You guys can see that. And say, so, okay, it's a little billiard ball. But that's actually an outdated view of the atom. The atom does not look like this. Any atom does not wave up like this. Instead, it's more like a fuzzy cloud. It's more like a fuzzy cloud. And in fact, the crazy thing, the reason that Einstein was so upset at quantum, because he found that the smaller you go, right, so you've got your, you're the scientist, you've got your little glasses, and you're looking in at this atom, is that it has something called wave particle duality, right? So when you think of waves, you might think ocean waves, you might think sound waves, like Beats headphones, something like that. Um, but actually, as you go smaller, it turns out that this thing that's small here, so say smaller than a human cell, is part wave. It's part particle, part wave. So in other words, it looks more like this. All this is the atom. Now, Ryan, okay, well, what, uh, what is all this? What, is, what, what length are we talking about? Technically, really this length, the length of an atom, really is actually infinity. I mean, it's a whole universe. Because the smaller you go, the more um, wave-like that thing becomes. The more wave-like that thing becomes. Now, think about a wave, for instance. Right? If I told you, you know, here's a wave. Think about this. Think about this for a second. If I told you this is a wave. I said to you, Ryan, where is the wave? How could you, I mean, it's here, 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 it's here. It's everywhere. It's everywhere at the same time. <laughs> so it's the same thing for, for matter. And that's why it was so frustrating people because they had a thousand years, 2000 years from Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, to Einstein saying, to Newton, to Einstein saying, you got a ball, you drop it, it drops to the floor. That's it, it's simple. But then they go smaller and says, well, how are we getting these weird properties where you're saying something small is everywhere, but then as it gets bigger, it's in one place? That's why people hate, that's why they hated quantum, like this makes no sense. In fact, Einstein's quoted, a famous quote saying, God does not play dance. God does not play dance. He was so frustrated, he's like, okay, how are we just playing chance and things are everywhere when on the Newtonian level, on an everyday level, right? If you say your cup's there, your cup's there. But at a quantum level, your cup's really kind of concentrated here, but it's really everywhere. So in other words, this is just this would be the general wave you might see. So the more mass something has, it looks a little different. So it's still a wave. But hold, hold on to that. Well, I show what I really like. There we go. So instead of it being a uniform wave like that, it's what you would call some people call it different things, but based on the context. But for this, I'm gonna call it a mass wave, a mass wave. So it would look more so like this. So that's the wave function. This would be what your atom actually looks like. So again, that's why I said this corresponds to that. This corresponds to that. So if as a scientist, I'm trying to find this atom. Actually, the way I would explain it to you accurately would say, well, 
Adam's probably here. It's probably here. And it might be over here, might be over there. I don't know. And so then when you measure it, right, when you actually observe it, you open and say it's in a box. And you open that box, what happens is that the universe, now this is the last thing that really just really, really pissed off of this is, um, is that when you open the box, it then goes to just back to being this billiard ball. It goes back to being this, this, this previous idea we had for thousands of years. It's back to being a ball. So how is that possible? And that's the thing about the universe, about quantum physics, is that quantum physics, basically the universe, metaphorically speaking, knows that you're watching it. It knows that you're watching it. Meaning that once you open this box, you got your little atom here, you got your atom in there, and you open that box, the universe says, ah, I see you try to catch me. You try to, you try to catch my wave-like properties. So it just shows you the ball. It just shows you the ball. And so that's what was so frustrating. Um, and now you're probably wondering, well, how did they know it was a wave if every time they measured it, you know, they had, you know, they saw the ball. It basically goes into a another, a whole other topic, but it's, it's called the double slit experiment. So I'd mm -hmm. recommend anyone who wants to know more details about that, just look up the double slit experiment. And basically you'll see that the atoms were acting like waves when people weren't detecting them. When they weren't detecting them. So it's really, really powerful stuff. And so with this, the atom, you're saying, okay, if we detect it, then it changes. Now, this threw science off for a loop. Because remember, remember for science, guys, let's pause here for a second. Why do we trust science in the first place? We trust science in general because not the humans who do the science. I'm not talking about the humans who do the science. Maybe funded by this person or that person or whatever intentions they may have. I'm saying the science itself is because it has evidence. It has results. In other words, it's not going to tell you, science is not going to tell you anything that it can't empirically show. It can't empirically show. So when we look at these theories of gravity, of Newton and Einstein, right, they said, listen, look, look at the math, look at the experiment. I can show you this works. So now you've gotten to a position in physics where I, can, I can't really show you what's actually there. I can't really show you what's underneath all this, what's going on underneath. And the fact is we can show there's evidence of something going on underneath, but not to the point where it's a whole other theory. And other what I'm saying is that they were so upset because they thought, okay, you've got this probabilistic thing. Everything we've had before says nature's not probabilistic, so there's got to be some deeper theory that we're just not understanding. There's maybe there's something below quantum, you know, that's giving us this probabilistic behavior. There's not. In fact, there's something called Bell's theorem, Bell's theorem, that shows that there are no what they call hidden variables, hidden variables underneath quantum that are causing this behavior. So, in other words, I'm saying to you, and this is what with the, the law is that so. Say, you know, you wake up every morning, say, okay, I gotta go to work, I gotta drive to work. Well, not anymore, right? Not for most people. But before 2020, right? We drive to work, say, okay, I've got to figure out the traffic, I gotta get gas, and you calculate, here's how long my trip would take, right? It might take me 20 minutes, 30 minutes to get to work, and then the day, maybe Fridays there's more traffic, and you plot out your course. Quantum says, well, listen, that's great. That you know all the variables, you know who, you know, who's gonna be on the road, you know what gas station you're gonna be at. That's great. You're still not going to know how long it takes you to get there. You're not going to know how long it takes you to get to work. Think about how crazy that is. So I can tell you and say, hey, listen, you know, Anna, Ryan, you know, all these people say, I'm going to tell you who's on the road, how fast they're going, what car they're in, their MPG. I could give you every single piece of information about everything related to you driving to work. But at the end of the day, you still would not know how long it takes to get to work. That makes no sense. <laughs> that makes absolutely no sense. And that's what frustrates people so deeply because it meant the universe, again, was probabilistic. That basically there's some part of the universe that metaphorically speaking says, you know what? You're going to take 30 minutes to get to work today because I feel like it. You're going to take an hour today because I feel like it. You're going to take 20 minutes a day because I feel like it. And so it just frustrated scientists to no end because, again, we do an experiment, right? How do you explain to somebody Right when you say it's 1905, you're Einstein and all these people. Uh, well, you know, we're supposed to have gotten this result, but the universe just decided to give us the other result. Um, so it's really, really crazy stuff. And I want to talk about that for a second in, in detail. So the reason that they have this challenge is goes into the philosophical nature of what measurement is in the first place. What measurement is in the first place. So you guys got to remember, anytime you measure something, 
you're actually affecting something. You're affecting something. Um, so take a second, take that in for a second. When you measure something, you are affecting that thing. And so anyone who has kids, you know, knows that. Anyone who's a teacher, who's ever been a teacher knows that, you know, you check in on your, and your kid's supposed to be sleeping, right? And they, you know, they put the thing away, you know, like, so you go to sleep, you know? It's just that in psychology, we call it the surveillance effect, the surveillance effect. So when people know that they're being monitored, right, their behavior changes. And so it's a similar idea, not the exact same thing, but some idea in physics in the real world. But the, the, the reason for that is because you, really when someone says they're measuring something, what you're really doing is you're affecting something with an intention, with an intention. Right. So in other words, you think about it intuitively again, think about every test you've ever taken in high school, middle school, every, any college, anything is so I'm the teacher. Right. And I say, guys, say from everyone I'm watching right now, I want to know how well you understand what I'm saying. So I give you a test. Right. I give you a test. Now, keep in mind, you might not know, you know, how exactly to you might be stressed out by a test. You might be like, oh, I'm a bad test taker. I don't know what I'm going to do. I start breathing heavy. So you may understand wave particle duality and you know photoelectric effect and atom meeting and divisible you may know those things but then that test you get nervous right and then you fail the test or something may happen your internet connection goes out you fail the test so my point is is that anytime you measure something you're affecting that thing you know you might be for instance in this example might be causing anxiety because of the test and even say well ryan was there a way to kind of do a pop quiz is there a way to kind of detect and say you know to got surprise guys surprise universe you know, you, you didn't have time to prepare, so I'm just gonna be able to see what you truly know. Not exactly, not exactly. Because that's what I was saying before, the interconnectedness of the universe is that every action, right, going back to, this isn't a little application, but every action has a reaction. So every time you do something, again, the rest of the universe takes in that response. Um, for those of you familiar with the Tao of physics, it talks about this, how the universe can be seen as a dance, this dynamic movement this dynamic movement of the universe. And so with the dance, with rhythm, right? Think about it, you, can, you, you dance, you can't just dance with one half of your body, right? You can't just dance with one foot. It has to be, it's all continuous, it's all united. It's all one being. Um, so understanding the interconnected universe understands why it's so challenging to build these quantum computers. Because one, they're so sensitive. Two, they're probabilistic, so they're already kind of moody in the first place. Three is that they're discrete, Right, and four is that basically the instruments you need to detect these things in their instrumentation by a physical fact, whether it be, so in other words, if a million years from now we made better technology to detect these things, there would still be an effect of the measurement on these quantum principles. So it's something you cannot avoid. You cannot avoid. Um, for really interesting, I thought it was really interesting, is that it, they used to think that it was, it was our own human brains creating, creating these results. They said it's gotta be, you know, our just consciousness creating reality. Um, which has really deep, interesting psychological and spiritual uh, ramifications. That was by John von Neumann. And it was basically the, the John von Neumann interpretation of quantum physics. So we got to be creative. So when I open that, that box, my mind is telling me it's a one or a zero. Not exactly. That kind of falls apart because the thing is, right, that we're humans. We're just one species. The world is not human centric. You know, the world, the physics laws don't care that we're human. You know, so if a, a dog, she would have the same, would have a different experience based on that answer, right? If it's based on consciousness, um, because they have a different level of brain capacity. Aliens, right? They might have bigger brain capacity or different brain capacity. We get different physics. We just shown not to be true. It's shown not to be true. In fact, bringing it back to Einstein really quick, what Einstein showed, I think a lot of people kind of misinterpret him, is they should, he, Einstein, people try to take Einstein and say everything's relative. That's not true. So Newton, let's start with Newton for a second, because Einstein, again, is a rebuttal of Newton. Einstein says, listen, or Newton says, listen, the laws here in this room affect, are the same laws that you have in your room. You know, the same laws that are in space, the same laws that are at the end of the universe, the same laws everywhere. The, 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 the laws apply themselves uniformly. Um, in a political science sense, you'd say there's a rule of law that applies uh, to everybody, to everything in the universe. Einstein says, yeah, but not exactly. Not exactly. So what happens, so say you're on a spaceship and you're going fast, not like 10 miles an hour, 100 miles, I'm talking about like thousands of miles per hour, close to the speed of light. Is that inside my bubble, anyone seen interstellar, 
the Apple is still gonna, you know, we're still gonna have the Apple drop to the ground in general, unless it's microscopic, you know, unless we drop it a billion times and it somehow phases through, like Quantum says. But me observing you in that spaceship is gonna see different things. Gonna see different things. So if you're going very, very fast, right? You're going very, very fast, and I'm gonna see you age very slowly. So when you come back to my planet, to Earth, I might be, you know, dead by that time. Might be 10 years later, while you might have just gone for a quick trip. And so Einstein's relativity isn't talking about laws inside our reference frame. He's talking about how we observe people in other reference frames. So same thing, right? So just think about our day-to-day -day lives. So honestly, all of us basically want the same thing. You know, anyone knows Maslow's hierarchy of needs knows we all basically want the same things. We want to be proud about the work we did. We want to, you know, be able to feed ourselves. You know, it, we, have, we all want these basic things, and, and but it, it takes different interpretations, right? Based on what career you're in, what occupation, in, how many how old you are, what your parents taught you. But it's still the basic drive for all of us, you know. And so that's the thing to kind of keep contextualizing everyday life. Because I know this stuff is very like esoteric, and what am I going to use this? I don't understand this. It's the same notion as our day-to-day -day lives, you know. So when you're at a restaurant, you know, you're hungry and you're eating. Right, but at the same time, and you have all these things going through your mind, how am I gonna pay for this bill and that bill? The other person next to you has the same idea, but they might, maybe they make more money, so it's easier for them to pay those bills. You know, so it's the same drive, the same responsibility, the same worry, the same concerns, but just we address them differently relative to each other. So someone might have an easier time paying a bill compared to you, or an easier time eating good food than you, or easier time going to the gym than you, but it's all relative. It's all relative, and that's my point there. It's all relative from one reference frame compared to another reference frame. But inside that reference frame, the rules are still the same. Everyone's born, everyone lives, everyone dies. Those rules are still the same. But it's in between that comparative that it changes. So I'll pause there for a second for any quick questions that we want to the last section, which is going to be applications of quantum engineering. Anyways. I know my hair's wild, guys. I'm sorry. I think somebody asked a question earlier. And if you could type it for me so I could answer it, that'd be great. Okay, so while we're waiting for Anna, I'll just go over to the next section, and then as they pop up, I'll answer them. So <clears throat> the last section in the last few minutes here is explaining the applications of quantum engineering. So I did a little bit of that already. I said that quantum computing is an application, quantum cell phones might be an application. So now let's talk about the wider range of possibilities here. Because this conference, I mean, it's, it's about the future, right? It's about seeing forward, moving forward. So we've spent... Most of the presentation talking about the history of quantum. Where did it come from? Who created it? What does it mean? What are philosophical interpretations? So it's really, really powerful. Really powerful. Um, let's see, we got this one question here. Building quantum blockchains. So building, oh, quantum blockchains. Okay, that is, that's interesting. That actually goes to an application of quantum engineering. Specifically one that I'll talk about. Now, this is loosely related, and I'll bring it to blockchain in a second. Um, it's called quantum internet. And so the way I'll show that to you guys when we do this. And so we've got our box. And we've got our box. Excuse my bad box writing. So the moment with the internet, we use what I was saying before talking about the blockchain question, elliptic curve cryptography. Elliptic curve cryptography. Quantum internet is the response to quantum computing. So in other words, think of it this way. You know, how do we, so if someone says to me, Ryan, how do you basically combat, how do you prevent quantum computing from taking my data? I and mean, there's different ways to do that. 
And it talks about updating the ledger, which I'll talk about in a second. But one way on a fundamental level, on a universal level that uh, doesn't even require blockchain or necessarily cryptography uh, as we know it, as we know it, is the actual hardware itself creating a quantum internet. So the way quantum internet would work, again, I'll remember all the principles we were talking about before. I specifically talk about the one where I said the superposition, superposition, where again, if someone detects, if someone opens that box, if you will, then you see one result or the other, one result or the other. And so the way quantum internet would work, well, first let me explain why they would create it. So you're gonna create a quantum internet because some of the similar concerns we're just talking about with uh, cryptography, if you want to keep your data secure, so you want to know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm sending these pictures to somebody, I'm sending information to somebody, I'm sending some code to some weaponry somewhere. I want to know that nobody in the world has access to this. Privacy. It's all about privacy. So when we think quantum internet, we think privacy, but think on the ultimate level. So right now, our quant our internet's based on these mathematical formulas. Number theory, for instance, factorization, like I said before. Quantum internet is powerful because, like I said before, with uh, elliptic curve photography that can be factored, that can be broken down by quantum computers, period. Again, there, we're not there yet. Experts think it's going to be about a decade till we get there, um, but it, it's, again, theoretically possible. Theoretically possible. So say I like was developed, you know, someone was developing a quantum computer in isolation, right? They were like 10 years ahead of the field or anybody else is that they could then break the blockchain like someone was asking before. Um, but after you completely, you know, no one else would be able to know about it and wouldn't have had time to update their ledgers. So quantum internet levels the playing field because instead of, instead of saying, well, listen, we've made this privacy where it's basically unhackable, where someone would have to use, again, a crazy amount of computing power, <clears throat> whether it be classical or whether it be quantum, to find out my information. Quantum internet says, hold on. Number theory, that's great. Factorization, that's great. You've made it very, 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 very difficult. You know, you've got to do calculations for the age of the universe. Awesome. Until, again, someone shortcuts that. Quantum Internet says, no, no, we're going to do something even more concrete. Concrete than number theory in this context. Okay, so, you know, what? we're going to use the physical law, the physical law of quantum physics to ensure that my data, when I transfer it to you, is secure that no one has interfered or overheard our conversation. And so they do this different ways. So first, let me explain that this is the fundamental. So specific projects will be using it um, with more nuance, uh, more specific strategies. But this is the fundamentals of how a quantum internet would work. And so quantum internet would work. And if you're very simple, so we have a box, <clears throat> and we open the box, then we then get a result, right? The universe knows we're watching it. Okay, that's not good. So, in other words, if I'm over here, then with the classic names used in quantum computing, I want to make you guys sound smart when you're talking about this, you know, to your friends, <clears throat> is you always want to use the names Alice and Bob. So Alice is oh, Alice is talking to Bob. Bob's talking to Alice. Alice talking to Bob. Bob's talking to Alice. They have a secret conversation. They don't want anyone else to come in and interfere. So what they do again, this is the fundamentals, is they have this box where it says that it carries their information, carries their communication with it. Right? And using the quantum internet is that quantum internet would be able to detect if, say, Bob gets his box from Alice and it's already been measured, the results already been measured, then he says, you know what? Someone's been in here. Someone's been in my box, uh, as suggestive as that is. And so if you're Bob, you know, if someone's interfering and listening in my conversation, and so I want to stop here for a second and talk about how do you prepare things in the superposition? So we're going to go into a little bit of math. Do not be scared. It's going to be okay. So a big question is how do you prepare yourself into a superposition? Okay, Ryan, what stuff are we talking about, first of all? We're talking about quantum, we're talking about atoms, what list is we're talking about? Well, again, the architecture behind this stuff is a bit fluid. So people can use, again, MRI techniques. They can use... Um, uh, topography, they can use uh, ultra cold uh, bits, uh, atoms. There's actually at MIT, there's actually an, uh, a sensor for computation using things that are very, very cold. Um, not just cold, like, you know, freezer cold. I'm talking about, again, you know, like absolute zero cold. I'm talking about like liquid nitrogen type cold, uh, like Mr. Freeze and Batman type cold. And so with this, 
is you've got to remember is you've got to apply a superposition. So you have your electron. Electron is a commonly used one. Um, some people use photons, but I'm going to stick with electron for this. You've got to have it in a superposition. So really quick, let's explain a little bit more what a superposition is. What are you exactly communicating to this guy? So before I said the superposition, right, is zero and one at the same time. Zero and one at the same time. That's, that's the basic principle. Now, what does that mean? Well, again, as I was saying, the challenge is that physically we don't have an image for that. Like I can't show you a superposition because the whole gist of it is that once I've observed that box, I've opened it, it collapses into just one. So I may just see a zero or one, but I'll never see zero and one at the same time. I never see a zero and one at the same time. So with this, okay, how do we talk about this in a more scientific, formalized, academic way? So you wouldn't just write a zero and one literally like this. What you would do is you'd write it in its, in its formalization. So the way you formalize this, you basically talk, you talk about it in a fancy way that people will respect you, is you write it like this. And so what that means to me, I know it's a little messy, what that means to me here, these little brackets, it's called bracket notation, bracket notation, is that it means that this is, you're telling me that this is a qubit. This is a, what's called a, um, a superposition. You're saying, okay, you've got zero and one together. Now this isn't the full notation. We're not done yet. But this says I've got a zero and I've got a one. I've got a zero and I've got a one. And so specifically, what you apply to this to get a superposition is first, you got to understand what a superposition is in the zeros and ones. So we said it before as left or right, thereby left and right, up and down, thereby left up and down. But specifically, a uh, common, the, the basis for the superposition is really in energy levels, energy levels, okay? So a lot of times we're talking about zeros and ones, we're talking about basically how excited is a electron. And so the way that we talk about it, right, so you've got what's called your ground state, that of course you can represent with a zero. And then you've got your other levels. You know, so you've got this one right here. You know, you've got other energy levels too. So when someone says it's a zero and a one, you know, metaphorically we can say up and down, left and right together, but also you can talk about energy levels. So if I say something is a superposition, right, of zero and one, that means that we know that its energy is somewhere in this range between a zero and a one. So but again, once you measure it, it either go between a zero or a one. So and and or are really important words here. And and or are really important words here. So when I say it's superposition, keep in mind, I'm not including zero or one in this. So if I haven't looked in my box yet, it's somewhere in the middle, but it's not here and it's not here. It's somewhere in the middle. Okay, so then it would apply to get it to that position, right? So you've got this electron in the box. Remember, remember, guys, is that we write a billiard ball, write a little ball, but it's not really a ball. It's more so like this. Remember, it's more like, like that. Wave particle duality. Let's bring everything together. So my mind, I could write a little, little ball, but what's going on really is a huge wave like that, and then it dies out at the end. It dies out at the end. So this is what's inside this box, okay? This again, this is often called a wave function, a wave function, reinforcing the fact that as you get smaller, you're now seeing things be actually more ironically more spread out. So as a physicist, I can't tell you the atom is, you know, in the corner of this box. I say it's the probability of you finding it in this corner of the box is X, is Y. So when you're talking about locations of small things, you would say it more by some probability than you would say to anything else. So with quantum internet, right? So we're using, we said here, an electron. We now, it's, which is actually a wave function. So it's concentrated in one particular place, number one. And then we're trying to transport this information from Alice to Bob using quantum internet. We know that it's in a superposition. In this context, that means that we know that its energy level is somewhere between a zero and a one. So I'm gonna show sure you guys a little bit of math. Okay, so don't, don't get scared, it's gonna be okay. So what we're applying is called a Hadamard gate. And I'll spell it out for you guys. A Hadamard gate. So it's H-A-D-A-M-A-R-D gate. A Hadamard gate. And a Hadamard gate 
in mathematics, we call it a transformation. A transformation. And just like any transformation, it just changes the thing you're talking about. It just changes the thing you're talking about. So specifically, a Hadamard gate can be looked at as a matrix, as a matrix. So a matrix just means a bunch of numbers. You know, don't, anyone who gets scared by the word matrix, don't worry. Matrix means a bunch of numbers. That's all that means. So H, again, yeah, setting for Hadamard gate, is here we go. Equivalent to this. Boom. And so what does that mean? It means you're gonna be applying this matrix and this number to whatever that, that state is. So for instance, the way this would work, the way you would write this out, is you'd say H and you would apply this H, you apply a half mark gate to that state, right? So we said, what are the notation, the bracket notation? Zero and one, right? So again, either it's zero energy or it's one energy. So say we apply this half mark gate to a zero. So if I'm Alice and I want to apply this half mark gate, so I want to put it in superposition, so I may communicate information between myself to Bob, the first thing I've got to do is apply a half mark gate. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm writing this right here. So I'm, I'm basically multiplying this matrix by this right here. And what that would give you is and so this is a high market. So if you notice, right, you've got a zero and you've got a one. Oops, hold on. Looks like something's missing here. You draw this part. And so you've got a zero and you've got a one. So this is now officially in a superposition. So now you as Alice can communicate this results to Bob. And so if Bob then gets a result where he just gets, say, one, he knows that somebody, I'll say Carl, has come in and observed this state. So that's called quantum internet. Quantum internet. And so this really answers one of your questions about change affecting uh, quantum blockchains. Currently, there are efforts to update, um, either create this, the quantum internet, or to update the elliptic curve cryptography to make it resistant to quantum computers. There's actually something called the quantum resistant ledger. You guys can Google. They've been around for a few years. And they're doing exactly what their name is saying, creating a blockchain that's really powerful. So before I, I, I finish up, I want to quickly talk about um, what, how quantum theories can also be used to find cures for diseases like COVID. And that's actually part of my work I'm doing with the White House right now. So, like, you know, let's keep the board. So the way kind of what we're doing with the White House, we're using a supercomputer called Frontera. Frontera is the eighth biggest supercomputer in the world. I'm working alongside my team. Um, our lead scientist is Logan Thrasher Collins, who's the principal investigator. Um, he's amazing, by the way. He actually created an anti- um, bacterial peptide. He was 16 years old. So many look him up. Uh, these are some people that really you should, you should know about that are really making huge differences in the world. And so what we're doing with the White House is we're using supercomputers to simulate, not necessarily this stuff right here, but to simulate the virus on the scale of nanoseconds. So it's about time. And then the viral membrane, looking at the spike proteins, meaning the proteins that basically could attach to yourself and say, hey, let me in, I'm one of you guys. Look at how that comes together using supercomputers. And a part of that process is understanding how the quantum physics, so not strictly quantum computing, that's why I said quantum engineering, is the quantum physics of bond formations, how the protein come together, how the membrane comes together, and it's really powerful. What's exciting is that in the future, where quantum computers are available, is that we would do things called Grover's algorithm. Rose Arbor, that's another key word I'd recommend when look up. What Rose Arbor does is that it allows you to search through a whole database without having to structure it, without having to structure it. So in other words, for data scientists, um, one of the big things we always look at is how do we structure our data so it's easy to understand. So in other words, the way I explain it to people who aren't quantum engineers and data scientists, stuff like that, is think about it, a lot of times when you when you clean your room, or we try when you lost your keys, right? You have to sometimes clean your room. You gotta clean the whole thing, and then in the process of cleaning your room, 
you find out, oh, they're my keys. I got to go. I'm late to work. You know, that's less than 2020 because we're all staying home. But in general, you've got to clean your room and find your, your keys. Quantum computers can basically scan a room, messy and everything, things hidden, you can't see anything, and say, the key's right there. So it almost looks like it's like Oracle. It's really cool. And grows our algorithm. So applying that to big problems like pandemics, the quantum computers in the future will be able to, to say, look at all these different compounds, different chemicals, different herbs from all across the world and say, you know what? This right here will be able to stop the virus from creating. And so with that, I'm really excited to show you guys what quantum computing is possible, but also the future of quantum computing, which is quantum engineering. So with that, thank you guys so much. Feel free to reach out to me at uh, ryan.robinson, my name, at conduitcomputing.com. Thanks, guys.